How many people have uh, registered? Um, about 200. So we can expect about 100 to come online. And from all over? All over. Um, but I see they're coming online now. So welcome, everyone. Please tell us where you're from in the chat function. Thank you. If you don't know how to get to your controls, you can just press the ALT key, uh, key, the ALT key, and you'll be able to get your controls and you'll be able to see the chat function there. And just let us know where you're from. We're just getting things started in the back end. Um, we've got about, there we go, from Canada. Welcome, Joburg, Slovakia, Katarina. Lovely to see you online. Thank you. We the just, ALT key. And you'll be able to get... There we go. So the YouTube live stream has started, which is fabulous. Norwegian mountains, lovely. Lesotho, also mountainous. Glasgow, lovely to see everyone here today. Thank you so much. Uh, Rhodes Business School, fabulous. Um, welcome, everyone. If, As I said, if you don't know where your function keys are, just press the ALT key on your keyboard, the ALT key. Um, they are the reactions are open. So if you like what we're saying, please react with a claps hands or a thumbs up so we can get some reaction. Unfortunately, we can't see you online, um, but we really want to make this an interactive session. Um, yes, if you've got you know comments, please put them in the chat function. We have got the Q and A function open. So if you've got any questions for us, if you can pop them into the Q and A function, that allows us to pick them up more quickly. Uh, than having to go through the, the chat function and find your questions. Um, we are from all over the world today, but a little bit of background in terms of the Good Governance Academy for those who are new to the GGA. Uh, we were started in 2019 by Professor King, and um, we bring together global thought leaders to discuss critical business issues as a public good. So we merge SDG 17 in Partnerships for the Goals of Collaboration, with SDG 4, which is quality education. And today we are talking about The Corporate Revolutionary, uh, which is a new book that's been published uh, about Professor King by David Williams. Unfortunately, David couldn't be with us today, so I'm taking his spot and I hope I can do him justice. Uh, today we're talking about The Corporate Revolutionary and really the lessons learned from Professor King's lifelong learnings um, that have been described in the book and others that he's been exposed to. And the first one I'd like to talk with is uh, on corporate failures and how they've been brought into the governance codes. Of course, South Africa's King reports of, of the namesake of Professor Mervyn King. So to start off with um, Professor King, welcome to another GTA event. It's a morning event. Mm -hmm. So we can um, then really bring in the people and make it available to the people in Australia and, and New Zealand. So welcome to those people. Um, the first question I have for you is really around in the book, you describe your experience with the frame group. And I just the questions that have come through is, is your experience there? How have you used those experiences of turnarounds, perhaps failures, perhaps um, opportunities? And how have those informed uh, your corporate governance codes and reports? Well, look. That's very, uh, it's a short question, but uh, a lengthy discussion. And I don't want to take the whole morning just talk about that. But um, I uh, was appointed as one of the trustees of the late Philip Frames Trust and his estate. Um, he died at the age of 72 in the shower of a heart attack one morning. And he had left a will, which was quite extraordinary. He had two daughters, and they had left South Africa, and he established a trust for each of them, 70, about 70 million US dollars for each of them. But then he wanted them to come back to South Africa, and both declined. And uh, his reaction to that was, well, then... I'm going to make sure you don't benefit at all from the rest of my estate. Now, the rest of his estate was worth much more than these two wealthy trusts. And um, he wrote a will, which I was then um, 
uh, no, I wasn't in practice. I'd stopped practicing at the bar, but um, he used to consult with me. And he came to me and showed me this will in which inter alia he left his entire estate to his grandchildren. And there were there were five of them. And uh, they not to get any money or any benefit until the youngest turns 50 years of age. At the time when he spoke... Five, zero. 50 years of age. Um, the time when he spoke to me, the youngest was 18 months old. And I said, Mr. Frame, you cannot write a will like this. It caused tremendous problems, difficulties, litigation. Anyway, he got um, an attorney in Durban to write the will for him. And um, one of the clauses was that he's left his wife 10,000 rand per annum, never to be increased, as an indication of the contempt with which he held her during his lifetime. He then went on to say that he's appointing forever. He was the sole shareholder of this huge company, the Frame Group, which was the largest textile company in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, that he believed that plant and machinery were up to date and he appointed three of his yes men as joint managing directors uh, for the rest of their lives effectively and um, i now become the trustee and uh, of the will and of the estate together with two other colleagues and um, the law in south africa as the law is in every country i'm sure listening in today is that a court should give effect to the wishes of the testator but um, i argued that um, this is so extraordinary that it's true the law is such but does a judge sit there and wring his hands and say well i must now give I must give you my approval to this extraordinary document. And um, so we actually went all the way to the appeals division. And uh, the court eventually uh, changed the will, um, removed the restriction, many restrictions, but not ev every one of the restrictions. And uh, Eventually, we did a deal with the three gentlemen he'd appointed as life sort of chief executives and did a settlement and paid them a sum of money uh, for them to resign as directors. I, I then became the chief executive of the group. There were 32,000 employees from Cape Town all the way up to Malawi. There were, there were factories. His belief was that um, you should never destroy machinery. So when the machinery became outdated, uh, he would move it to an area where government wanted to create employment and they subsidized the wages. So there was a very thin margin, but a huge headache from a management point of view. So the first conclusion I came to, and the board agreed with me, that it was a collective mind decision, that we had to start closing factories from the top of Malawi, Blantyre, all the way down to Cape Town. And I closed the blanket factory in um, Harrismith that nearly destroyed the town. I closed the spinning mill in East London, which employed over 2,000 people. 
nearly destroyed East London. And and so I went on. And the plan was to bring it back to Durban, which was the home of the frame group, reduce the number of employees, reduce this overweighted head office, um, and go to our machine suppliers, which was a Swiss company called Silsa, and get them to make the absolute most modern machinery. And um, he spent this huge amount of capital in putting in modern machinery and actually getting rid of the old machinery as scrap. And um, so it took some five years to reduce the company from 32,000 employees down to 4,500. You can imagine that. And to reduce it from closing factories in Cape Town, Bloemfontein, Durban, Blantyre, Harare, all over Southern Africa. Um, just all focused back into Durban. And the modern machinery made could make uh, as much fabric as before, but with four and a half thousand people. That took five years. But one of the interesting things, Carolyn, that um, uh, people online may or may not know, something you all do is you all wear jeans. And to make jean fabric takes a lot of water. And I was astonished to learn that it takes over a thousand liters of water to make a length of jean fabric in order to make a pair of jeans. And I said to our, our machinists, surely you can make a jean fabric machine that doesn't use all this water. Um, because at the time, I was very aware that South Africa was a water-constrained country. And um, business is at the junction of the economy, society, and the environment. So really, even in those days, so I'm going back to the late 80s and the early 90s, I realized that um, you couldn't just, this was an absolute to me, a waste of water. And... Um, they worked for two years on redesigning and redoing and eventually developed a machine which used, instead of over a thousand liters of water, was 400 odd liters of water. That machine still operates still to this day. So hundreds of liters of water have been saved just that one, one uh, machine. So it was one that was one of the factors that got me very interested in the question of governance. Obviously, I was practicing governance in restructuring the board and getting and retrenching people, etc. But um, the question of that business was really at the junction of three issues, and that, in my opinion, Milton Friedman was absolutely wrong to say that. Business is about making profit and profit for the shareholders. Why pick on a particular stakeholder? Why pick on a stakeholder that has no duty or responsibility to the company? Why pick on a stakeholder that has this no duty and no responsibility? And the concomitant of that is that if the business fails, he goes to the back of the queue to get dividends off to the creditors and the employees. So that was rankling in my, in my, my brain. And um, the other company that I turned around for which I became businessman of the year in 1987 was the Kirsch Trading Group. It was the biggest trading group in Southern Africa and I was chair of great companies which a lot of people online would know metro cash and carry uh, which 
Metro started in Europe and then came to South Africa. I became chairman of Metro Cash and Carry in South, South Africa. And then chairman of Checkers Limited, which is one of our great supermarket chains. And so I became chairman and one of the biggest buyers of fast-moving consumer goods, food, for example. And um, the apartheid regime, uh, the hardship really was in the homelands, it was to put people back into a homeland. That is, um, the Zulus go back to Zululand and the Pedis go back to the, where they originally lived. And uh, But there was no infrastructure in these places. And so there was hunger. And that led to the start of Operation Hunger. And being the biggest buyer of food products in the country, I asked food manufacturers like Tiger, Premier Milling, could they not develop a packet, a nutritional package, packet for as cheaply as possible to feed children. And they developed one for 34 cents a day. That was about the size, but absolutely nutritional. And uh, we fed over a million children a day for 17 years. And Mr. Mandela's daughter worked with me at Operation Hunger. And um, that's how I kept in touch with him while he was in jail. And when he came out of jail, he had a lunch for 12 people. I was privileged to be one of them. And um, when he came to me, he said, Judge King, and he always called me Judge King. If it wasn't for Judge King, there'd be a few million useless citizens in South Africa. Because if one doesn't feel, feed a child under three, three months, uh, the brain actually starts atrophying. And um, so you get a useless member of society. And all these things were ringing in my brain the day that I got a call from the IRD South Africa in 1992. Um, Adrian Cadbury had written a code for how businesses should be conducted in the, in, uh, America, in uh, the UK. And um, they wanted, they thought I was the right person to write a code for South Africa. We were going in 1994 into our, into our democracy, into a country of equal opportunity from a country of unequal opportunity. So a completely different country. And they thought we needed to write a code on how to steer a business for those who'd never been in the corporate world. And uh, they thought I was the, the right person. Uh, um, they thought I had turned companies around, which we've just discussed. I had become businessman of the year. I was a lawyer. I was a legal advisor to the Institute of Chartered Accountants. And uh, they thought I was the man. And uh, I said, let me mull about this and think about it. Well, serendipity, but that often I got a call from Mr. Mandela, who had great prescience. He wanted to talk to me about the education system in South Africa. And um, as you know, it's still not correct, uh, Kerry. Um, uh, and I said, by the way, Mr. Mandela, I've had this call from the IODSA. And I'm mulling about it because I've got so much to do. I'm chairman of some big companies. I was chairman of Frame. I was chairman of First National Corporate Merchant Bank, chairman of Operation Hunger. And I was, please believe me, I, my time was very really occupied. And uh, he said, do it. You're the right man. That was the end of my mulling. <laughs> <laughs> And that's how I came to do King One. And I can say I did it because I, I wrote every word of it. And um, one thing I knew, the committee which I formed, which was reflective of our new Rainbow Nation, 
I steered them away from the what they'd learnt and knew, namely the primacy of the shareholder. Because I concluded if we came out with a code based on the primacy of the shareholder, it would be completely unacceptable to the majority of my fellow citizens. It would, in the language used today, be seen as white monopolistic capital. And um, so I stayed away and focused rather on the long-term health of the company and learning and understanding the needs, interests and expectations of the stakeholders to use that knowledge in formulating what was in the long-term best interests of the company. And uh, that thinking started going around the world. And, um, and but I learned uh, you need you need subcommittees and uh, <laughs> you need someone to head up those subcommittees to write in King 2, which um, I recommended sustainability reporting as because I had become chair of the United Nations on Governance and Oversight and chair of the Global Reporting Initiative. So it was very steeped in sustainability issues. And uh, by uh, in, 19, in 2002, I recommended to the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and recommended to the what they had assumed my name, the King Committee, that um, we needed to do sustainability reporting according then to the GRI guidelines, which were all about the activities and how they impacted on the three critical dimensions of the economy, society, and the environment for sustainable development. And um, so only the other night I was at the JSC uh, speaking about the book and um, and Leila Fari, who's the chief executive, the present chief executive of the Stock Exchange, we um, reminisced about how the JSC was always the stock exchange one step ahead, ahead of any stock exchange in the world. In 2002, following the King 2 report, uh, sustainability reporting according to the GRI guidelines became a listing requirement. 2009, King 3 uh, integrated reporting became a listing requirement. And then um, in 2016, when um, King 4 came out and we looked at it being more mindful than just ticking boxes and saying, I've got an audit committee, I've got a nominations committee, etc. that you actually apply your mind to try and achieve four critical outcomes. So that was a long answer to <laughs> Thank you. I've got uh, so many questions. Um, so, yes. Um, so first of all, I, I think, um, let me start with the, with the frame group. Um, clearly, the, the lesson learned there is that there, there are winners and losers in terms of stakeholders. So uh, society, the impact on communities and closing down all of those factories, and then the environmental, it's a, it's a, a negative impact versus a positive impact from the environmental perspective. Um, just in terms of that, can I just ask a question? How, how did you, and of course, sorry, on Operation Hunger, there was a positive impact on society, very positive impact on society. Um, and of course, with retail and plastic and waste, the negative impact on the environment. So we, we get both, um, which you brought in the concept of this um, interconnectedness of the, of the organization in society and the environment. But just a personal question, how did you deal with the closing down of those uh, all of those factories it must have weighed heavy on on your shoulders it weighed heavily on my heart it was uh, especially harry smith harry smith is a small town between durban and johannesburg and it was a blanket factory and uh, we employed 1100 people there virtually we were I think the, certainly the main employer in Harrisville. But it effectively destroyed the town. 
and I knew it would. And I went there and spoke to the mayor and said, gave him the reasons why I was closing it down and uh, and uh, tried to um, try to help as much as I could. But it nearly destroyed the town. And in retrenching people in Durban, we started an organization called Zenzalini, which is a Zulu word for help yourself. I cleared out one of the weaving sheds. Uh, people who don't know the textile industry, a weaving shed can easily house a Boeing 747. It's huge. And we cleared out all the machinery and just put sewing machines, row after row of sewing machines. And what we did, we trenched people and then sent them to Zenzalini to this warehouse where the frame group, we supplied them with knitted fabric at cost. And we got someone there teaching them how to make simple garments, T-shirts, pajamas and things. And they started a business selling this. And one of the people from the labor union well, it became the manager, and he went on to go into business, and today uh, he's a billionaire. Wow. <laughs> so, there's, so the benefits really, you know, of being, as you say, mindfully applying, uh, you know, the collective mind of the board in understanding and being accountable for their for their impacts, and then obviously bringing that in as a, as a listing requirement. But on, on that... Um, you said it went round the world, this stakeholder inclusivity. How do you feel about the term that the World Economic Forum has brought out, uh, a stakeholder capitalism? Is that the same kind of thing that you were looking at the codes, at instilling in the codes? Uh, the answer is no. And I, I don't like the phrase. Um, capitalism sort of is an all-embracing term. Um, what really my thinking is that the board directors individually and then as a collective as the board should make decisions which they believe is in the long term best interest of the health of the company this incapacitated person for which they are the heart, mind and conscience um the, the company, uh, as I said yesterday when I was speaking uh, at Tudor's conference, the company, it's very really interesting if you, all of you online associated with the company, but whichever company with which you are associated, you've never touched it, you've never seen it, you've never held it, and that's because it's invisible, it's intangible. It's an entity, it's a legal fiction that was created in the middle of the 19th century. And uh, the governance architecture was that people would be appointed to steer the company, the directors. And the people who put in money, the subscribers, the original subscribers who put in money became, we called them shareholders because they were taking a share of the company. And they had become the reluctant providers of capital because in owning businesses and the businesses failing, they were still liable to creditors and employees. And they became reluctant to continue giving money. The government, of course, wanted them to continue doing so. And the intellectuals of the time hit on this idea of creating this legal fiction, the limited liability company. And the limitation was put up your capital and you'd get a slice of a cake, a share. And uh, the concomitant of that was you'd have no duty or responsibility to the company. And um, you'd go to the back of the queue when the company failed, if the company failed. If the business of the company failed, you'd go to the back of the queue after creditors and, uh, and um, employees. What happened from the 19th into the 20th century is that these wealthy people 
then started appointing their brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts as directors. And the perception, particularly of the employee stakeholder, was that the shareholders were the owners of the company. Well, um, if a shareholder removes a pen from a company, it's a theft. Why? Because it's an asset of the company. It's not the shareholder's asset. And the shareholder has no duty or responsibility to the company. So the great uh, asset owners or institutions today, so if you take in the South African con uh, context, Old Mutual, which is an institution where people save money and they uh, minister pension funds, etc. So it's one of our great financial institutions in South Africa. The Old Mutual, in appointing directors to a company, uh, owe a duty of care to Old Mutual's beneficiaries of that pension fund which they administer. But they don't owe a duty of care to the investee company in which they're investing in the equity of that company. They can, if they want to, uh, Trevor Manuel's the chairman, he could um, he could appoint his friend at the golf club if he wanted to as a director of that company, nominate and with his, let's say, being a majority shareholder, appoint that person as a director. But then he'd be failing in his duty to the beneficiaries of that pension fund, which Old Mutual is administering in not appointing a person that has the right skills and understanding to add value in the long-term best interest of the health of the invest of the company, which he's going to invest um, the, that beneficiary's money. So people, don't, people have difficulty in getting their minds around that. Uh, someone who uh, claims to be very astute with the corporate government said to me, that our institutions all over the world are failing to appoint the correct directors. And eventually I had to point out to him, it took some time to, for him to realize that they had no duty or responsibility to appoint the correct directors. Their duty and responsibility lay to the beneficiaries of the pension fund which they were administering. And if they didn't appoint the the correct directors to the investing company. They were failing in their duty of care to the beneficiaries, but they never had a duty of care to the investee company. So it's, you want to get your mind around that. And it's the same thing when something goes wrong. The shareholder doesn't can't sue the share directors personally. It's the company that's got to sue the directors. And the shareholders can only sue derivatively by getting permission from the court to sue as if they are the company. I've always advised clients never to do that because they spend um, lots of money suing and eventually succeed. And a lot of times the directors haven't got the money to pay, but as soon as they've got the money to pay, where does the money go? It goes to the company. It doesn't go to the successful litigators. And the company's got to pay who first? The creditors and then the employees and maybe there's nothing left over for those who have been litigating that's exactly how the corporate uh, scene is set up so um, when there's a failure of a company um, legally there are a lot of consequences and one's got to think about it i think the great failures around the world uh, carry has been uh, been enron um, they failed because the directors just had a lack of appreciating that they were the guardians of the company's assets and um, their business affairs. Um, they started subsidiary businesses, and if they were not successful, they sold them to a company which had been formed in the Cayman Islands. And so they took them off balance sheet, this loss. And this loss kept building up, of course, but it wasn't seen in the main company. And eventually when it was discovered, uh, Enron um, 
I think it took two, three days. It just blew up and uh, it was liquidated. J. Uh, Arthur Anderson um, were the external auditors. They'd built up their reputation over 90 years. Mr. Anderson, the, the founder of Anderson, the external auditors, accounting firm, um, had refused to be the auditor of a major company in Chicago because the directors wanted him to audit and not qualify as audit on a certain aspect, and he refused to do it. And um, they removed him, Anderson's, as the auditor, and it was one of the most lucrative auditing jobs in America. And he was quoted in the Chicago newspapers and New York newspapers everywhere as saying nothing would be worth ruining the reputation of Anderson. And yet it was Anderson that when this bubble burst with Enron, started shredding their working papers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, so that the investigators couldn't find and get to the bottom of this formation and getting all these matters off balance sheet. And it took just a couple of weeks for Arthur Anderson to collapse, and it was one of the big four at the time. It was one of the big six, if you can, big five and the big four. So if you look at 2008, when uh, Lehman Brothers collapsed, Lehman Brothers was one of the financial giants of the world. And they had a simple business of advancing money against the collateral of immovable property. Uh, for certain reasons, the value of immovable property, especially um, residential property, was dropping. And um, they had parceled certain of these loans and sold off certain of these loans again, fortunately, to a company formed in the Cayman Islands and took these uh, events off balance sheet again. And um, there again, the external auditors didn't design, but they didn't qualify those audits. So it came through the financial reporting that stakeholders were actually deceived. Three days before the facts became known about uh, the Lehman Brothers, it had its highest share price on the stock exchange to its um, over 100 years of history. So when it was discovered, it just took a couple of days to collapse. That collapse was so huge from a financial point of view that it impacted, I think, on every limited liability company in the world, both balance sheet-wise and operation. And shortly followed the GFC, the Global Financial Crisis, which was really founded on this collapse of Lehman Brothers. And it impacted on limited liability companies around the world. And, um, and then I think one of the events that really showed all of us why society is so important. Obviously, society is important because it's your customer. Just, that's just one aspect of it. But the pandemic showed us that things could happen from a social point of view that could be very destructive of the company. And boards had to change their mindset and actually become collaborative and understanding of the hardships being suffered by the stakeholders. But likewise, the stakeholders had to understand that the company itself was going through hardships because of the pandemic. So um, uh, there had to be this compromising sort of mindset on both sides. And I coined the term coronanomics, that really we were living in a new era that was Economics was being practiced not as we had done for a couple of hundred years, but it was being practiced on a collaborative basis, understanding the hardship of both, both sides to the equation, both supply and demand, were suffering. And so um, you had uh, people were compromising, 
course, as I pointed out to many companies at the time, it's better to compromise and keep the company going. Because if you go into liquidation now, you try and sell the assets, you get nothing for them during the pandemic. Also, the skills in the company become dispersed around the world. You never put it back together again. And rather try and keep it going and wait for the pandemic to die down and and start thriving again. And that's what most companies did. And But it, had, it needed that change of thinking of the board to be collaborative and understanding. And then exactly the same, the stakeholder of the company had to understand the company itself was suffering hardships during that pandemic. So you've got to think differently. And um, Steinhoff was uh, is the major, I think, uh, corporate collapse in South Africa. And that was shared as honesty. And where the chief executive who committed suicide um, took subsidiaries and uh, formed them and started operating the sale of furniture in over 30 countries and pumped up the profits in those companies. And uh, I think one of the reasons was they had sort of second tier auditing firms auditing these subsidiaries in these different countries. And then Deloitte was at the top where, the, where there was um, all this was brought together and the consolidation was done by Deloitte. And the question has always been asked, did Deloitte apply its mind sufficiently to, or did they accept the unqualified audits of these second tier companies in all these subsidiaries around the world and then consolidated at the top? That's never really been decided. And um, it's never really been, it's a study that I think some accountant has to do one day when a situation like that arises how does how does the accountant react to it what 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 does he really do what what happens so i think it's a great matter for a phd <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it needs to be studied and uh, and thought out right sorry i'm just rambling yeah. on Any no questions? that's perfect no that's um so what I'm hearing you say is that um, in the beginning, you spoke about how the uh, you need to consider environment and society and bring and that was brought into into the codes, into the reports. Um, and then you were talking about the financials and the way that the the financials happened with Enron, uh, Lehman Brothers and the impacts and even uh, Steinhoff and the impacts of those. And we also spoke about the uh, stakeholder cap capitalism, the responsibilities of of owners who are actually not owners they the, the initial shareholders but actually they don't have a duty of care to the company they they have their duty to invest their money appropriately um so that there's actually three aspects there um in terms of the shareholder that we spoke about in stakeholder capitalism the environment and society being an interested party a stakeholder and then of course we've got the the financials of the organization and what i'm hearing you say is that bringing those all into a code of, of of corporate governance um has really needed a tremendous amount of experience to understand how this all fits together this can't this is not a theoretical although you say it needs a phd it's not a theoretical exercise to create a code of corporate governance but then we see it the as a result of the lehman brothers there was a, um, a response by the United States that was one of a, um, almost as you mentioned it, the tick boxing, tick, ticking the box <laughs> approach to a compliance-based approach. So just trying to understand the, you've never advocated for a, a compliance-based approach. Um, you've always advocated now, certainly it's instilled in, in King 4 and the ISO standard 37,000. It's a principled-based approach. In taking all of that information and putting it into the codes, um, why have you not followed the, the more kind of the, the, the compliance-based approach? 
Well, I, I think the answer lies in having a look at companies that have been compelled to follow a mandated approach. And I think there can be no better example than South Africa. Our state-owned companies, where the government is the sole shareholder, uh, in about 2002 passed an act of parliament called the Public Finance Management Act. They changed the language, chief executive became the accounting officer. So there was a complete focus on the financial aspects. And this had to be done in a particular way, and they actually set out in a section how to get it done, and then another section how something else had to be done. So what happened is our state-owned companies were spending up to 60% of their time on conformance, making sure they were doing things in terms of as set out in the legislation. So otherwise you went to jail for 10 years. Um, and 40% on performance. And it was in those conformance things, for example, procurement, that you had this tender process, which I believe was the source of a lot of uh, corruption in South Africa led to state capture, which has been through with uh, Judge Zondo. Um, uh, procurement uh, became warped. If you had someone on the inside who knew exactly what was needed and someone on the outside, they would conspire with them as to how to tender and what to tender. And um, on the basis that one they were su the successful tenderer, they'd get a kickback. And so it started. And uh, it multiplied to the gigantic uh, proportions with the Gupta brothers and uh, the then President Zuma, so that um, they actually captured the state. It was like one state running in parallel with the government that um, was in power. Um, so that the tenders for building a new power station, for example, um, were far excessive to what it was. The governing party um, made sure that a tender was successful for large parts of the machinery for building a new power station. And uh, part of that large price went to the political party. And so um, this question of legislation, and you get this mindless approach to uh, governance <laughs> and a box ticking exercise. I believe it needs to be mindful. You've got to be, and how do you become mindful? You look at the outcomes. What are the outcomes that you achieve by governing the company? And what are the outcomes that the external stakeholders are seeing? So they can draw an inference that you're either a good corporate citizen or you are not a good corporate citizen. And um, I think, um, there are four outcomes which we came to conclusion after 18 months of research in King 4, uh, which if they are achieved, the external stakeholder will come to conclusion this is a well-governed company. And it's very interesting to me in the capital markets of the world, today if you and our directors carry over a company and we want to raise a $100 million uh, bond, we'll issue the bond for consideration for a week with a particular coupon. Well, of course, the uh, great asset owners or asset managers will do a due diligence financially, but they now also do a due diligence from a sustainability point of view. And they do the due diligence on an outcomes basis. Is this company really creating value in a sustainable manner? Is, is this company really one that is still got the trusted confidence of the community in which it's operating? Has this company really got systems which are adequate and effective in the way it's run? Are the directors really 
effective and efficient. Do directors really understand that um, the company is an incapacitated entity that has no heart, mind, or conscience of its own, and consequently, by definition, can commit no wrong? And when something does happen, it's the directors that have committed the wrong. So the wrath of society should be against the directors, not against, not against the company. And um, uh, this understanding is starting, has gone around the world now. Also, that to think on a silo basis, as we were all, certainly I was taught at university, was absolutely wrong because operationally these things are all together. And um, if you're making um, a face cream out of coconut oil, well, you take the coconut oil and put it into the plant and machinery. Financial capital is already involved because it's bought the plant and machinery. Along comes somebody else, human capital, puts the other ingredients in, intellectual capital is involved. And that's all mixed up and eventually um, it becomes the cream which goes out to society. Well, now your outside stakeholders are involved. The other seed is a good cream or it's not a good cream. And uh, the company, either becomes, the business becomes successful or not. But operationally, these things are all integrated. They're not with the coconut oil in one building and the financial capital in another city and so on. These things are all integrated 24-7. So it was interesting when I was chair of the United Nations on governance. IFAC came to Geneva and we had a discussion. We came to three critical conclusions. Of course, at the time, research was showing that um, only about 20% of the market cap of companies listed on the great stock exchange of the world was reflected in the balance sheets of of companies, and 80% was not being reported on by directors, so were directors really being accountable to the company and through the company to all the stakeholders. We came to three vital conclusions, that financial reporting was critical, but not sufficient to discharge the duty of accountability. Sustainability reporting was critical but without the financials was clearly not sufficient. To report the financials in a silo and the sustainability in a silo was divorced from reality because it's not how companies operate. These things are all integrated 24-7. Hence the concept of integrated thinking and integrated reporting was born. And... Um, People have often asked me, well, what's my proudest moment? I think my proudest moment was when suddenly the the uh, light bulb was switched on and people started realizing these things are integrated. You can't look at them separately. These things are really integrated. And so there's no organization, I use that very big like generic term today, I think in the world it does not think on an integrated basis. Everybody thinks on an integrated basis. Mm. So that Bastille has been stormed. And um, what we found in practice in the countries where there's integrated reporting, the board, it actually starts from the top down, not from the bottom up. So the board just says we're going to do integrated reporting. And then they've got to look at their business model and look at it through the the three prisms of the economy, society, and the environment, not just the economic, as, as uh, Professor Friedman would have it. You look at it at through the three prisms of the economy, society, and the environment, because business is a conjunction of that. And nobody can say, even those that have written an article in America, saying this ESG is a fad. Well, it's not a fad. In fact, the ESG, in my view, should be turned around. It should be GSE because governance is the most important thing. If you're not thinking in the correct manner, you're not gonna deal with the social and you're not gonna deal with the environmental issues in the correct manner. And um, so um, it's important you think on that integrated basis. And um, there's um, a webinar tomorrow 
um, which I hope many online will attend, including you too, um, Jared and uh, Kerry, um, where the IFRS is going to discuss the importance of integrated thinking and doing an integrated report. Now, they've taken the out of the integrated report and put in SF1 of their ISSB. Uh, sorry, I'm just assuming people know all these. <laughs> I'm putting them in, don't worry. <laughs> ISSB, um, they put it SF1. Um, um, they've taken stuff out of the content and I'm going to put an SF1. This is how our standards should be developed. Then they've developed the standard on the risks and opportunities of climate change, and they're still developing the other standard. Um, uh, they developed the standard, with the principle of interoperability, so that if you and I are directors, and there's something that uh, really to us seems important and could influence the mind of a user, but it's inside out, it's not an outside in impact on the company. Um, we should disclose it. And through the principle of interoperability, um, I said, well, if it's interoperability, you can, Mr. ISSB, you can choose any audience you like, the chosen investor as their audience. You can say you want to have information in your sustainability standards that only have a financial impact. Fine. But you can't change the law. And the law is quite clear that the board owes a duty of care to the company to disclose material facts, material in the sense that it would influence the mind of the user to either say yes or no, to continue being a shareholder, continue providing capital to the company, whatever it is. So Let's say, for example, that uh, you never had this principle of interoperability where you could bring something which is from the inside out and use a GRI standard, let's say, to answer that question. And you didn't disclose it. You'd have a misleading non-disclosure. Now, in legal cases, many are decided on not what people know, but what they seem not to know, which they ought to know. So exactly the same in in a company, where you and I see something which is material. We think really this could influence the mind of a of a stakeholder. But we say, well, we're following things just that have a financial impact. So we're not going to disclose it. So you say, well, I. I've, I've, to the T, I follow the ISSB standards, but I'm not I'm not disclosing this uh, inside out uh, factor, which is contrary to what the ISSB is looking for. Um, you actually commit a fraud on the on the user because the user doesn't have that in doesn't have that information. So. Mm. It's going to be very interesting to see. Um, and they've taken their management commentary, the IFRS, and expanded it and taken things out of the IR framework and put it into the management commentary. Management reporting to the stakeholder, to the investor. So you've got, first of all, management has never reported to stakeholders. Management reports to the board. And... Um, the board then issues its corporate reports. So it's going to be very interesting in the discussions tomorrow to see how they handle this, um, the IFRS. I mm. believe the only way for them to handle it, they've got, they've acquired the IR framework, uh, is to do an integrated report. Then you cover both inside out and outside end impacts from a sustainability point of view. And don't forget, you're dealing with 80% of value now of a company from a market mm. capitalization point of view. So, um, uh, we ran out of time. <laughs> there could Sorry. be a lot of corporate failures in the future involving sustainability issues. Mm. 
because we're because not reporting on everything that's material. Well, that could happen. And not only that, um, you're not in thinking strategically. The board is not dealing with uh, adverse impacts on the environment. And uh, when that becomes known, you've got a problem. Exactly the same that happens in your supply chain. If in your supply chain, let's say you are a garment manufacturer and uh, you're getting your fabric cheaper than you could get anywhere from a supplier in uh, Morocco and uh, you're not worried about supply in Morocco, how they're governing the company and uh, they're using child labor to reduce expenditure, for example. Well, when that becomes known, you could be listed on the London Stock Exchange. You could lose 50% of your market cap in the first day of trading when that is known. So, and that has happened uh, right around the world, right around the world already. So, one of the interesting agenda items which are on the boards of lots of companies today is supply chain. Mm. You've got to be aware of your major suppliers, how they're being governed. If they're being governed poorly and they're breaching humanitarian rules, for example, um, it's going to impact adversely on your company because you are getting the benefit of using these, this, this child labor. And uh, it really is something which should be disclosed. But if your supply is being governed properly, well, you can say, you know, in your report, our suppliers are being governed properly, they're responsible corporate citizens, and, and uh, you're fine. Uh, but once it's discovered, um, so it, there are many examples on the stock exchanges where companies have lost 50% of their market cap in a day of trading. So um, we have run out of time, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll be no. No, that's exactly what we wanted to hear. Thank you so much. Um, we've got lots of questions. Um, we on this is not our last event, so we are going to hold another event. We're going to answer these questions because a big question that's come up is is how do you penalize for corporate failures? Is is a fine good enough? And you've already touched on it here. So this is leading into it, is that actually society will penalize for corporate failures, as as you've now been telling us. Yes, society will, and uh, they'll stop being customers, etc. Et and cetera. Uh, but um, uh, what has motivated me over the years is planet Earth, because I saw it being degraded before my eyes. And um, I really believe that the most important citizen in every country in the world is the limited liability company, because it's the platform which capital is raised and jobs are created. And it is the biggest user of natural assets. And natural assets are still being used faster than nature is regenerating them. So if we don't get it right in the corporate world, well, I'm afraid planet Earth may not be around by the end of the century. So we've got an awesome responsibility as directors and I hope the directors around the world appreciate that. Thank you very much. And with that, I'd like Thank to you, conclude. Lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.